first. Uh, we're going to get Tim Legler, ESPN, one of the best analysts out there for sure on all things NBA. And, and, and what a perfect time to connect with you, Tim, because I, I don't know that I can remember, and I'm specifically talking about the Western Conference this year. I don't know if I can remember a year where it got this intriguing this fast. Like, usually the first round is kind of like, eh, whatever, right? We, you know, it's obligatory. But Kings and Warriors, Lakers and Grizzlies, and I mean, I'm shrugging my shoulders, man, to see which way either of these series goes. What do you think? No, you're 100% right. It's a great description of the Western Conference this year. And, and, you know, the other thing I'll say is most years you also have a particular matchup that's almost like, you know, two trains are going to collide down the road and everybody knows it's coming. You know, it's a foregone conclusion at some point. These two teams are going to have to go through each other. The West hasn't looked like that at all because these teams have been so incomplete most of the year, whether it's injuries, missing guys, not playing well, um, making major trades at the trading deadline, you name it. Other than probably you know, Denver, who we expected to be there somewhere in that top three, and they've been pretty much intact. Other than them, I mean, you've got Sacramento's been an incredible story. Memphis has been there. But I think, you know, Memphis, we kind of knew was going to be somewhere in the top four. After that, you look at what this West has looked like all year long and now what we potentially could have in this first round. When you've got dangerous teams like the Lakers, like the Warriors, like the Clippers, who have, you know, literally just kind of trudged through the regular season and now they're trying to get whole and get right and get complete at the right time of year. It did come together fast and there hasn't been – any set matchup we've looked at in the West all year as, as something we expected down the road. This is all new stuff, and these top seeds, I think, are in, in, in a little bit of danger as we start this first round. What are you looking for in Game 1 as an indicator of, of you know, some, you know, if Sacramento were to win this series, is there something that you're going to look for in Game 1 that would tell you that they're on that path? Yeah, it's, 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 it's absolutely how Golden State defends. I mean, they've been very, very inconsistent defensively all year. And when they've typically, when they've won championships, they've been one of the top rated defensive teams in the league. They don't get enough credit for it because the offense is so unique and so, it's so much eye candy associated with the shot making. You forget about how good they've been defensively. And that just hasn't been the case all year. So that's what I'm looking for. You're talking about the highest scoring team in the league in Sacramento going up against a Golden State team that has been very good defensively all year and you know just missed having Andrew Wiggins for two months. You get him back into the mix, that's a huge, you know, that's a huge help defensively. But you know, what's his stamina going to be? What are his lungs going to look like? What what kind of impact is he going to have? He was just so good last year in the postseason. I think we're all waiting to see what exactly his role is. He's certainly going to help them defensively immediately, but I want to see if Golden State can slow this train down because Sacramento plays fast. They, they have a number of different guys that had their best years as pros. They've been healthy all year. Um, so this is a team that's really rolling. They've got a lot of confidence. I want to see if Golden State can slow them down. If you see Sacramento come out and you know have a you know 70-point first half in game one, that's a really bad sign for the Warriors when you've had you know a number of days now to prepare for this opponent and you, you, you're getting Wiggins back. If they can't slow them down, in game one and show me that defensively they're prepared for what this series is going to present the challenges, that's a bad sign for Golden State. The interesting thing here, Legs, is the fact that uh, everything you just said uh, about the Warriors defensively trying to slow down the Kings, I guess I could make the same point in the other direction on the other side. Like, the Kings have been, by metrics, uh, like one of the most you know poorest defensive teams in the whole league all year long. What what kind of pro and I know the NBA is a little different this year with regard to that, but what kind of prospects do you give them in the playoffs? In that, they, like they don't seem to actually ever play defense. Yeah, I mean they 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 win games differently. They they've been doing it all year long. They played they play with a lot of of initial pressure up the floor with De'Aaron Fox. They've got guys running to the three point line. And, and because they have a number of guys that can hurt you from deep, they spread you out, and Sabonis dominates in the middle with all that space he gets in there. Um, so that's how they they win games. They're set up to win on the offensive end of the floor. So look, this is gonna this has got the makings of an absolute shootout, you know, from start to finish. And I think that's what we're expecting to see. Ultimately, 
ultimately, Golden State, I think, has a lot more room for improvement defensively because you're, you're, you're re-acclimating Andrew Wiggins into this situation. That, that's the difference. You know, Sacramento is what they are. Nothing's going to change. They're not adding some elite-level defensive player here right before this series starts. Golden State is. And that's why I think the room for growth is, is more with the Warriors than it is the Kings. And that's why I think the Warriors are going to win this series. If Sacramento were to get game one, you know, I mean, just looking at the Warriors historically in this championship run, they're 21 and three. The Warriors are straight up in game ones. That includes a two and one record on the road. If Sacramento were to take game one, would that alone shock Golden State's rhythm? No, I don't think so, because look what they've been through as a group, you know, and and their core and the number of, of, you know, must-win type situations they have faced over the years on the road or in any playoff series, they're not going to be phased by it. Uh, They just, they have an ability to rise to the challenge when they need to. And for me, the biggest element for that team that I needed to see this year, and you're going to see it here going into the postseason, I needed to see Clay Thompson get back to, to the level he was at offensively at his peak. And it might not be quite as consistent as it was at his best, but he's all the way back physically, and he has that ability to dominate games again. That, to me, is the biggest element for the Warriors that I needed to see uh, at some point this year as they head into the postseason. So they're not going to be phased by losing game one. They know who they are. They know what they're capable of doing. They've done it in the past many, many times. And for Sacramento, if you really want an indicator of, of, of can they win this series, it's not going to be necessarily one and two. Because I, I think that's probably going to be a split. That's what I think is going to happen. It's going to be can they win game three going back you know, to Golden State. That, to me, would be the indicator. If they go into Golden State and they win that first home game, because typically when series shift from one venue to the next, right, from game two to game three, there's an enormous adrenaline rush from the home team in a game three. Whether they're down 2-0 or they got a split, it's just a different atmosphere. If Sacramento can go win that game or one of those two, let's say, to get it to a 2-2 series, that would tell you a lot more, I think, about the Kings than anything that happens in those first two. Tim Legler, ESPN, one of the best analysts out there, is with us here on 95.7 The Game. I'm thinking about all of the different aspects of this series and everything you just said about about the you know the home and the road. Uh, what about another thing that we've heard a lot about, which is familiarity? Obviously, these coaching staffs know each other so well. How do you see that affecting this series? That's a great that's a great point, and you know it, it's there's definitely a lot of admiration and respect going across both sidelines. You know, Mike Brown, well-deserved coach of the year uh, for what he did. I thought it was the best team story in the league this year by a mile, what they were able to do in the Western Conference. Um, yeah, that matters. It plays into it. You know, it, you know, Mike Brown not only was the architect of what every, everything they did defensively when he was at Golden State, he's also a guy that sat there every night watching Steph Curry and Clay Thompson play and Draymond Green. So, Yes, it, it, it absolutely is going to have a bearing and an impact in this series, uh, but it won't be the determining factor. I think both of those guys, they know what they're doing. They know what buttons to push. They've got a lot of cards to play. Here's, it's funny, I said this to somebody about the Kings a couple of days ago, and it was kind of ironic. You think about it, the year they just had, finish third in the West, go through 82 games, and I said, you know what's crazy about that? We don't know how good they are until now. We're about to find out how good the Sacramento Kings are because one of the things they took advantage of this year, and I don't know, I looked at these numbers a couple games before the season, and it might have changed at the end if they sat some guys. I don't, I don't really know. But at one point, very late in the year, their top six scorers had missed 24 games total all year combined. So what does that mean? It means if your guys show up every night and play and they're just out there and available in a conference that had guys missing every night amongst those contending type teams, you have the ability to take advantage of this vacuum that was created and they jumped into it as a three seed. But I think it's a little bit misleading because of all of the issues that some of these teams had with health or just roster turnover. As the year went on, look at Phoenix, look at Dallas, look at the Clippers and, and all the games they missed. Look what Golden State went without for a long period of time. So you have all these teams, the Lakers, you have all these teams 
that just completely underachieved because of all of those reasons. And here you got the Kings just saying, hey, listen, guys, if we just show up every night with our top guys, there's a chance here to really make some ground in the West. And now we are going to find out exactly what that regular season meant for the Kings. You know, I think Sacramento's got got to do a number of things to win here. I think and they, you know they got to win on the glass. I think they got to get to the foul line. I think those are key factors. They got to win the turnover battle, and they really didn't do any of those things against Golden State head to head this year. But what surprises me, legs, is the Kings have been better on the road. They have more wins on the road than they do at home. Is this game one more important for them because of that? Absolutely, there's no question for so many reasons. Okay, so you have a team that they're playing now with four championships, right, six finals appearances. This this is a team now, you, you, you come off this regular season, everybody now has taken notice of the year that you had. Absolute surprise to be third in the West and so much to prove. And if you look at their their, their roster, I mean, Darren Fox is a guy who's turned him into an all-star guard. It's a bonus, you know, I think, for me, in, in guys with their first full season this year, uh, he's in that category with a Jalen Brunson and a Donovan Mitchell with the difference maker. I think those three guys are singular in first year changing teams, first full year. I know he played a few games last year with the Kings, but his first full year with the team, what a difference he has made. And then these other guys, right? They all have something to prove because they're outcasts from other places. Kevin Herters and Malik Monks in the world. These are guys that have a lot to prove. Harrison Barnes. So they've been such a great story. Can you imagine how much air would be sucked out of this if they come out game one and Golden State puts it on them? Hmm. It, it's really going to be cold water in their face after after the year that they had. So, yes, it is critical that they get out to a good start and win game one if they want to actually win the series or even make this a long competitive series. They can't lose the first game because I think then they're not going to start to doubt themselves because these are pros. But I just think the pressure then – is going to just mount, and it might be insurmountable because the year they just had, that would just be a gut punch to start out that way. You're listening to 95.7 The Game, KGMZ FM and HD1 San Francisco, always live on Twitch, YouTube, and the free Odyssey app. Tim, you know, you keep talking about the regular season that the Kings have had. Here's a question I got for you. If the Warriors and the Lakers end up winning these first-round series, uh, especially with their, you know, mediocre records, the way they handled the regular season, what does that say about the NBA regular season? I've been saying it all year. It, it's, it's been almost rendered meaningless, and I, and I mean that. And it's because of load management plays a big part in it. But it's not just load management, because load management, what that really is, is a number of games that are penciled in before the season even begins or as they're playing, where on a given night a healthy player is not going to play to rest, okay? That's one problem. Another problem is the amount of time that is taking guys to come back from injuries. Like the same injuries that guys have now, the same injuries they had when I played from 1990 to 2000, they're the same injuries that guys have from 2000 you know, to 2010. Same injuries. You know, t- tight hamstring, rolled ankle, you know, the same stuff we all deal with. Guys just take twice as long to come back from those things now. So that just extends the number of nights when these guys are not out there. And then just the way that teams go about the lack of urgency for seeding and where they want to finish because you don't even know who they are until you know the all-star break and trades are made and then you've got 25 games to get yourself together, slap it together, and go make a run. So I, I think in large part, a lot of the NBA regular season has been rendered meaningless. It's not great for the league. It hurts the product that these guys don't play. The fans pay the biggest price, but it's not just the fans. It's networks. It's the, it's the advertisers. The, everybody pays by guys not being there when you sit down to watch a game. And as a result, if you get teams like, you know, Golden State, I'm not saying Golden State necessarily treated it that way as much as some of these other teams, but if those two teams advance out of the first round with the years that Memphis and Sacramento had, yes. It says, well, it says a couple things. One, those teams have a ton of talent, but it also says as long as you have guys right when the postseason starts, that ultimately is all that matters to these teams. If you can go then and make a successful run through it, very few teams have been able to pull it off. Maybe this is the year that teams can, having a regular season that's very mediocre, getting right at the right time, and then making a run through the postseason. Legs, I love uh, GP2's game. I mean, he's such a dominant defender. I mean, he kind of reminds me of Michael Cooper going way back to the 80s. But um, 
what would you do if you're Kerr? Where would you want to deploy him? Do you do you make him smother Malik Monk and just try to take away Sacramento's number one bench scorer? Do you put him on Fox? How would you utilize GP two? Yeah, all over. But I think if you're going in and you're targeting it, I don't necessarily think you know it's going to be on De'Aaron Fox as much. I, De'Aaron, De'Aaron Fox is going to have the ball so much, and so much of what he does is going to be off ball screen offense. Um, and that's hard for, that's not really about an individual defender. That's, that's, that's a team concept. And that's making sure your communication's tight. Your coverage is right. The screener, the, the guy defending the screener has to be able to do his job. There's going to be a lot of switches involved in that. So you can get him off of the Aaron Fox because of the number of ball screens you get. So that's not going to play out that way. But if you put him on a guy like Monk, you put him on a guy like Herter, guys that, are coming off pin downs, guys that are not going to be as creative with ball screen offense and, and go chest to chest and go no help responsibility and deny and fight over these pin downs. And, and, and then when you do get beat off a curl or you get beat off, continuing to track and come from behind with your hand over the top as these shooters try to make shots, I think that can have a bigger impact than putting them on a guy that's going to get 50 to 60 ball screens a night and can almost dictate who he wants to play against because of all the switching that takes place in his league. Legs, I hate two-part questions, but I'm going to try to ask one that's super clean and easy to follow. You already said you think the Warriors are going to win. I need to know how many games, but the extension of that is, and the second part of the question, uh, how many teams do you have as possible to come out of the West, and are the Warriors one of them? Warriors are definitely one of them. It's crazy because I picked them to repeat before the season, right? So we put our preseason predictions in, which don't mean a whole lot, but I picked the Warriors over the Bucks in the NBA Finals. I feel, feel pretty good about the Bucks getting there. I haven't felt great about the Warriors most of the year, honestly, uh, but always in the back of my mind, I was making sure to never dismiss them. You know, whenever I would do a list all throughout the season, hey, give me your top five power rankings, whatever. You know, once a month I'm doing this on the air. I always had the Warriors somewhere around there because of my pick and because of just the danger that they represent by, by who they are. And if they ever get right, I, you know, in watching Clay, I'm like, he's back. They, don't dismiss them. Um, so for me, I think the Warriors are definitely one of those teams. I'm not going to be shocked if it's Denver. I mean, they're legit. They're a number one seed for a reason. I love their starting five. I love the impact and the way, number of ways that Jokic could beat you. Um, so I think Denver would be in that category. And then I would say Phoenix. I think those are the three teams. It, and, and I thought the Clippers had a shot. If Paul George was able to be 100% coming in and they didn't match up with Phoenix, I thought the Clippers could, could have a legit chance. They're not going to beat the Phoenix Suns with a, with a Paul George that's not 100%. I think Phoenix clearly is that team that maybe by the end of the first round, a lot of people are going to be looking at and saying that's actually the team to beat. These teams play incredibly fast-paced uh, basketball, and when they played head-to-head this year, it was far and away the fastest pace in the league. If the pace at any point slows, d- does it favor a, a one team or the other? No, it definitely favors Golden State uh, if, if it slows because of the experience they have playing deep into the shot clock. It's one of the things that has been so tough about them with the way that they play and like for instance, particularly a guy like Curry, you know, the number of, of motions and movements that he's willing to go through on one trip up the floor and the way that they will make you play in all the way down inside of five seconds on the shot clock without settling for something. And they still continue to get a layup cut, a curl cut, you know, a drive kick out three very late in the clock. Cause they, they don't play, panic they play with poise in those situations and their movement dictates you've got to guard them for the entire clock so if you talk about a game that slows down where shots are taken inside of six seconds on the shot clock that's definitely going to favor the warriors tim legler espn great stuff okay so warriors in how many games in this series i'll go six i think they'll end up winning that sixth game on the road wouldn't be shocked if it ended up I'm sorry, game six at home. It wouldn't be shocked if it went seven and the Warriors won a road game in Oof. game seven. But I think oh. they win it in six. Oh, gosh. That, <laughs> g- that gave me a mini heart attack, Warriors <laughs> in seven. But uh, I don't know if I could take that. But, uh, Tim, great stuff, man. Thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure, guys. Anytime. Thanks, Tim. Talk to you soon. Yeah, absolutely. Tim Legler, ESPN.